Hello and a very warm welcome to all of you joining today's webinar. We hope you are all healthy and safe. I'm Ben Simmons and serve as the head of the GGKP Secretariat. Today's webinar, Sustainability After COVID-19, Building Resilient Supply Chains Through Resource Efficiency, is the seventh in our series and is organized in partnership with the German Corporation for International Cooperation, GIZ, and financed by the German Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, and Nuclear Safety. We want to sincerely thank these partners for their support. We are delighted to be joined today by a very distinguished panel of global experts who will explore how governments and industry can together support small and medium-sized enterprises and how they can respond to the COVID-19 crisis and increase resource efficiency uptake through their supply chains. During today's webinar, of course, please feel free to make comments through the questions box. It's a great opportunity to engage directly with our experts. A full recording of the webinar will be available on our website at ggkp.org. And after the webinar, we would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete our short survey. Uh, the feedback truly does help us shape future webinars. Our next webinar in this series will take place in two weeks at the same time and will focus on green buildings and infrastructure in the recovery packages. The panelists will consider policy approaches for ensuring the short-term stimulus packages contribute to the long-term sustainable transformation of the construction and building sector. We look forward to having you join us then as well. Now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Stefan Sikars, the moderator for today's event. Uh, Stefan is the Director of the Environment Department at the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, where he leads the organization's efforts on circular economy and oversees projects focused on cleaner production, water management, and a range of other issues. Uh, and importantly, uh, particularly at least from my perspective, is Stefan is also a member of the GGKP Steering Committee. Uh, Stefan, I am delighted to welcome you to today's webinar and hereby turn the virtual podium over to you. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, I would like to welcome you to the webinar as well. Um, ben has already alluded to some of the um, work that uh, we are doing here at UNIDO. UNIDO is the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, where we do exactly that, the industrial development. And so one of our tasks is to uh, find ways forward and actually um, implement them and help developing countries to take them up on how to combine environment with uh, increasing the resilience, efficiency and profitability of industries and to achieve mutual, mutually beneficial outcomes, mutually beneficial for the countries, for the industries and for the environment. And one of the ways to do that is what we are talking today about, the means uh, to build resilient supply chains, which is the resource efficiency. Um, I would like to use the opportunity to actually introduce you to an excellent panel that we have established for you today. And I'm starting with uh, Mariana Heinrich from the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Mariana is the director of, uh, for energy, leading the energy program, facilitating the global coalitions of business and external stakeholders. Um, welcome to the, uh, the seminar. Secondly, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Michael funke Bartz. He is a senior advisor for climate change environmental policy in the in GIZ, the German large implementer in development aid. Um, the third I would like to introduce is Mrs. Vikash Goswami. She is uh, the head of consulting in boundless environment resource solutions and uh, has uh, previously also worked uh, intimately with large industries, particularly Godrich in India. Mrs. Claire Lund is from GlaxoSmithKline, the head of environmental sustainability and uh, is experienced in energy and uh, as being an energy and sustainability director. 
And finally, last but definitely not least, Mr. Louis Munoz uh, from the RSCP Net, the Resource Efficient Cleanup Production Network. He is the regional executive for the Latin America and Caribbean regional chapter. And I'm very happy to have him around as well. And with that, um, thank you panelists for being here and sharing your time with all of us. Thank you to all the listeners and viewers of this webinar. And uh, I would actually like to go right away into the questions that we have thought about. And the first round goes into the concept of the resource efficiency, which is a means principally to increase profitability, but also to increase environmental sustainability of enterprises. But how can this resource efficiency support the business recovery from COVID-19? And uh, maybe I can ask you, Mariana, to start with sharing your perspective on the subject. Wonderful. Thank you, Stefan, for that uh, introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me to be part of today's uh, panel discussion. So. Um, Maybe before I start answering your question, a quick um, uh, recap um, on my title as well as the organization that I come from, which clarifies what position I take here today in this panel. Um, so being director of energy working at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development means that I'm representing the energy perspective, particularly in the panel today, as some of the other colleagues on the line do as well. Um, but particularly, um, I'm representing multinational companies who are often having very big Big extensive supply chains and hence how they look at their supply chain of course matters within this discussion very much. So coming to the question that you've been asking, so I'd like to, to actually um, start with thinking about how resource efficiency matters always as a first order of priority, irrespective of if we're finding ourselves in a global health crisis or not. Um, and I think it's it's, it's generally important to any type of business um, and to any type of resource efficiency that we're talking about from material to energy to water, um, that it is about using materials in a more efficient manner. So using um, fewer inputs um, from suppliers per unit of output. Um, and that ultimately, of course, saves costs and make, um, makes business more resilient. Um, and that applies in business as usual, as well as in any type of shock um, that we find ourselves in. And, and unfortunately today, it, it is COVID-19. Um, I think a second point that we've been looking at at WBCSD is how actually companies that are already resource efficient today are less impacted by the crisis because they are managing um, on average, of course, um, better. Done a quick analysis on our members and found actually when it comes to um, ESG, environmental social governance data, that um, our members um, who are tending to be those with a higher sustainability credentials and, and ability to manage um, have weathered the downturn 10% better um, in terms of um, against the average market in terms of their stock um, and equally return to business as usual um, price levels quicker uh, and, and that means already today in some instances. And I think that's what really we're talking about here. It's, it's how do you how do you improve your resilience today and as we're coming out of the COVID crisis um, slowly, um, but hopefully shortly, how is the resource efficiency um, supporting companies in their recovery? And I think hence we have this unique opportunity for change now where companies are more perceptive in the way that they can set new standards and introduce new practices, new behaviors, if it goes from employers um, uh, to employees, to customers and suppliers alike. Thank you very much, uh, Mariana. Um, that was, uh, there were already a number of very interesting um, points. In particular, coming from you as uh, uh, someone who works for a large association of larger industries, typically. And I would like to turn to Michael, actually, 
who maybe can, in terms of industry size, work on the opposite side of the spectrum. Uh, and uh, with his profound background in SMEs and working with SMEs, maybe can share some of the insight on the same question on how that would uh, affect uh, maybe very different types of businesses. Mm -hmm. Please, Michael. Okay, thank you, uh, Stefan, uh, for this question and uh, uh, for inviting me to this uh, panel. Uh, I think, uh, as GIZ, working in many uh, partner countries, uh, OECD countries and non-OECD countries, uh, I think we are in contact with SMEs as well as big uh, brands. Uh, uh, and so I think uh, I bring in uh, the understanding from both sides uh, of the value chain. But of course, uh, the reality of SME in developing countries and uh, emerging economies is something where we have a close uh, insight. And let's be realistic, uh, even before COVID-19 hit the, the world economy hard, resource efficiency measures in SME didn't just happen by itself. When we talk about SME in emerging economies and developing countries, we have to be aware that many of them do not have a lot of liquidity uh, for investments and uh, that one erroneous uh, investment decision might already jeopardize the whole business. This makes them risk averse and rely on business as usual they know, even if it might be inefficient uh, in terms of resource use, uh, in energy consumption and whatever. But on the other hand, it's also understandable because uh, you can imagine uh, that in these environments, a lot of consultants make recommendations with unclear chances for success. And so doing something they know is part of securing the business instead of running into a risk. And uh, what happens, for example, if striving for resource efficiency, uh, the quality goes down uh, and uh, uh, would lead to complaints by customers. And so this uh, attitude to be risk adverse also uh, blocks a little bit uh, uh, them from going more into resource efficiency measures. And uh, if we look at SME that are part of international supply chains that are quite uh, volatile, we also have to recognize that the large brands define the quality and the price, in many cases, uh, of uh, the product or service uh, they uh, want to uh, procure. And uh, there's this uh, challenge that a supplier that uh, wants to invest into resource efficiency measures or into measures that are more environmentally responsible or socially responsible, they cannot be secure that they get a contract the next year as well. And so how to make an investment if uh, I'm not really sure that this will be a payback in a, a, a time that uh, can be justified. And uh, even if investments in resource efficiency might have relatively short payoff times, most of them need investments. And so uh, investments need planning security. And if we want suppliers become more environmentally and socially responsible, off-takers should provide them with more planning security. I think this uh, is one of my messages uh, when it uh, goes into uh, companies working on international supply chains. And this was true before COVID-19 uh, happened and uh, will be even more relevant in the post-COVID-19 future. My fear is that many SME in emerging economies and developing countries will not survive due to a fragile financial base and such companies will be even in a weaker position to negotiate better conditions for their products and services after uh, COVID-19. Thank you very much, Michael. May I uh, throw still the ball once back to you quickly? Um, and that is because um, as a very excellent introduction to your bottom line that you made in your intervention, asking for more planning security and uh, how should I say, a responsible addressing of SMEs by um, the off-takers of their products, by their customers, by multinationals. 
I think in the way there you were also expressing a certain um, doubt about the ability to actually bring resource efficiency um, to companies because you actually mentioned a number of barriers for the uptake which sounded to me um, not at all optimistic. Uh, did I get the right vibe or uh, uh, do you want to clarify there a little? I think uh, I didn't want to spend all my powder at the beginning, and of course, <laughs> uh, I will be in the position also, uh, yeah, to give a positive uh, uh, outlook. But uh, of course, uh, that means uh, if we look at uh, countries we work in, uh, where uh, we, as overall target we have uh, to contribute or we want to contribute uh, to more resource efficiency and SMEs, uh, we have to say that uh, just to enter the company say, and we help you with uh, resource efficiency measures might not be enough. And uh, what we experience is that it is necessary uh, to approach companies in a more holistic uh, approach where one really looks at the uh, constraints that are blocking these uh, uh, companies from being more profitable and more uh, productive and uh, uh, help them to really raise the money they need for later investments also uh, in uh, resource efficiency issues. And I think this is also something uh, where uh, RecipeNet, for example, with uh, the business counselors uh, plays an important role. Uh, and of course, uh, if uh, we look at a narrow perception of uh, resource efficiency, this might not be enough. But if you come uh, to a more holistic approach, I think it can be an important uh, contribution uh, to strength and resilience. Turn your microphone on. Thank you. Yeah, already, already <laughs> realized. Good software here. Reminds me immediately that I forgot to turn yeah. on my microphone. So. Um, Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, Louis, I know you have taken note. You're very welcome to, um, in addition to what you want to say regarding the question, to also point to your views on related topics. But before we go there, I would like to uh, turn the floor over to Vikas. And actually, you are, in a way, if I look at the two previous speakers, you're kind of bridging both approaches since you are uh, worked a lot with large-scale industry, but now you work on the interfaces um, between SMEs and large-scale industries, and maybe you can share your viewpoints on the subject as well. Yeah. Um, to give a little demographic profile, in India, 70 to 80 percent of the manufacturing happens in the non-formal sector. So these are not only SMEs, they are even nano-micro industries. And unfortunately, in COVID, and you may have read about it, that migration, reverse migration is happening because the employers or the contractors were not able to feed or give remuneration or payments to the labor. And it's a tragedy that's happening across the country. The labor is walking back to the respective houses because we are, we are in a lockdown till the 1st of June. Now, in such a scenario, when we're talking about resource efficiency, we'll have to look at primary sector resource efficiency agriculture, fisheries, mining sector, because resource efficiency from there will become very important because these returning migrants will now become an added responsibility on the same piece of land, on the same piece of pond to fish and uh, cultivate something to survive. The migration back to the cities may take another six to eight months. So it's going to impact the primary manufacturing sector, which feeds into the secondary and the tertiary manufacturing sector. If you're looking at the greening of the supply chain, most large companies in India, even the Indian multinationals and the other multinationals have started to talk about minus one. But beyond the minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, the supply chain just dissipates. And the decision is often always 99% taken on price points and not on how resourcefully or how sustainably you resource your primary sources. So the nature of the game needs to change and the business case has to be built if it has to be successful. From your perspective, where would you see who should most change, the customer 
the supplier or the government trying to shift the framework? Um, from my experience, it will be have to be a collective effort. The government will have to come up with a better policy or the better frameworks. The private sector has to be willing to bite the bullet to move from profitability or for profiteering. You have to weigh those two options out. And the small and the medium enterprise has to take on the onus and not hide behind always saying I'm a poor manufacturer, so hence I can't do that. It has to be a collective effort. One sector doing it is not going to achieve it. Thank you very much. And I would like to come to Claire again, looking at uh, how resource efficiency can support the businesses to recover. Um, now you're coming from a very different type of business, uh, although uh, I know that uh, you have lots of suppliers, which are actually, you have lots of suppliers, and among the lots of suppliers, lots of them are actually uh, also smaller ones. So more generically, um, how do you see that resource efficiency can support business recovery? <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, and thanks, Stefan, for the opportunity to, to come and represent here. I just to set the context for those that don't know, so I come from a global multinational healthcare company. Um, so we do have supply chains globally and we do have thousands of suppliers within that supply chain as well. Um, and to, to Mariana's point, we are part of the World Business Council as well, um, which is, I think is a great organisation uh, and you need to really start to bring this together. So from my perspective, and that is just to set that context, the question around resource efficiency, I would probably echo the points um, which are resource efficiency is also about bottom line profitability. So fundamentally reducing energy, reducing water, reducing materials or circling them back in to use is about bottom line profitability. I mean, we've seen it on our own operations. We've seen it in our supply chain as well. Um, so for me, that is where resource efficiency really does help profitability, both pre-COVID, but actually even more so and probably intensified in a post-COVID world and environment. The other piece I would say in a post-COVID world is partnerships, being agile with who you're working with um, and how some of the resources and the efficiency can start to enter different parts of the supply chain. We're seeing that just in, in some of the attitudes we're taking, working with, you know, in typical terms, competitors, um, and actually setting up you know, automated testing facilities, working in a different way and being more agile with our supply chain and our employees. So a lot more resource efficiency <laughs> on, uh, on home working. Um, so I think there's also gonna be a post COVID world on looking at, at the supply chain differently. How do we partner? How do we become a bit more agile? Um, and then what are then going to be the supporting networks and frameworks that will help that continue? And this isn't just an intervention that disappears after a bit of time. So that's just my, my opening perspective, but um, hopefully providing some of the other, the other views across the piece. Thank you so much, Claire. And I know we will come um later to more questions into that direction that you have already indicated. Um, maybe later, maybe now, uh, one of the things that shot through my head was uh, that, of course, uh, as a company who represents the end of the supply chain, essentially, I mean, mine is the consumer, but for many highly complex products uh, actually does, um, you will have after COVID-19 and also in light of the uh, um, Bali, which is currently uh, related to trade, is happening, international trade. You will, of course, have to work on your supply chains quite a bit to increase resilience for all kinds of shocks that you anticipate. Maybe we can later come back to that perspective as well. We don't have to do it right now, but uh, I want to give you a moment of time. But maybe, um, maybe you can share a little bit what, from your perspective, that means that how that might look like, and then we might be able to jointly discuss what that then means for resource efficiency, for SMEs, for other participants in the supply chain. What do you want to wait a little bit for that, or do you want to shoot right away? 
Uh, I'm happy to, to wait if you want to broaden it out, but. <laughs> Okay, then then let's uh, let's see later. We will come back to that point then, and we come now to Louis. Um, I move <laughs> to you, among other reasons, uh, full of happiness. I mean, one because of our close affiliation to RCPNet, of course, and it's good to see you. And secondly, um, I'm happy to you bringing in uh, on the ground perspective of how resource efficiency is actually being lived and can be advanced or cannot be advanced in many cases. So maybe you can share your viewpoints uh, on the question of uh, resource efficiency being able to support businesses in the recovery of COVID-19. Thank you and thank you Stefan and thank you for the invitation and it's an honor to be here and when you are the last one and you have some positive points because you can hear and know all the comments about our colleagues and uh, uh, great comments. And, and, and the negative point is sometimes there is no, no new comments <laughs> about it, the point that we are discussing. But and I, I resolve, I, I think that the comment about the Michael, the security plans, Right now, this is very, very important for the small and medium companies because uh, the, these kind of companies, uh, like a micro and small, usually don't, don't, don't have uh, this kind of uh, methodologies or, or plans. And right now, uh, we, we think that here in Guatemala and a lot of our colleagues in the receipt net, we are thinking that maybe the receipt is a, a great opportunity try to 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 help to these companies to include the the environmental item in these plans because uh, right now the i think that nobody uh, are uh, knows how to to be prepared with this uh, situation or this uh, emergency and the companies try to understand right now how to survive in this uh, situation and try to understand how the customer or uh, the supply chains are changing, changing, changing right now, right now. And resource efficiency maybe can help to introduce in this plant and in security plants to bear more um, efficiency in this process right now. Um, last week, we, we, we are talking with a environmental minister in here in Guatemala, and, and we define that it's very important to, to make some kind of recommendation to the companies to introduce the resource efficiency in these security plants and biosecurity plants and safe, safe plants in the companies. And, and another uh, aspect that I think that resource efficiency can help in this situation right now and post COVID is uh, like a uh, clear cell that, and Mar Marianne, Marianne, sorry, and uh, introduced right now that the supply chains is very important from the big companies because uh, the big companies are changing too and they are thinking about how to maintain the supply chains but the, the, this, this situation are changing all the model right now about how to uh, how to maintain the relationships with the stakeholders and the customer. Um, right now, the micro companies are trying to survive in, and 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 they don't understand how to um, change right now about the principle with the customer changing. Right now in, in Guatemala, the customer are changing a lot, not to the sustainable thinking, just to try to maintain the uh, lifestyle. So a lot of, of persons is try to maintain the uh, lifestyles and not uh, to survive this situation. And this is very important to, to think about it, how to, to cl make close the security plans right now with the resource efficiency. This is like an idea that 
we are trying we are thinking right now in the technical perspe perspective thank you very much luis uh, and i would like to um, maybe first go a little bit into more clarification i would like to separate um, two issues and one is means how to um, enable in particular smes along the supply supply chain to implement resource efficiency measures from the question of how do we increase the uptake, how do we increase the interest of uh, uh, participants in the supply chain, in particular SMEs, to actually then do it. So technology availability uh, versus uh, in a second step then uh, what are the motivation, what are the barriers and what are the incentives that might be employed. So if we if you go first um, and look at what is needed actually, what support services, what support in general would SMEs need uh, to implement resource efficiency measures and um, are these services existing and uh, can they be accessed sufficiently? This, as I mentioned, presumes that there is interest in it. We come to that later, what can motivate interest, but maybe we can go to this particular point first and um, uh, by the virtue of um, experience and the introduction you did Michael um, also of the work the little that we that we heard already maybe you can give it a run first uh, to say to tell us what is your perspective uh, of the services that might benefit SMEs. Uh, when we look uh, at uh, the OECD context, uh, I think a lot of money is now made available to support uh, the economic recovery. Uh, if you look into Europe, uh, European countries, uh, you already witness how strongly uh, the economy has been hitting, has been hit. And so the question is what's happening uh, in developing countries in emerging economies? Uh, will there be also this uh, effort uh, to secure or to contribute uh, to the survival uh, of uh, the SME that are really uh, the basis uh, in many countries uh, of the economic development. And so, of course, uh, on the one hand, we have advisory services uh, that uh, help uh, companies uh, to uh, identify and implement uh, uh, measures that contribute uh, to resource efficiency, to cost savings, but uh, in many cases also to climate protection. But uh, I think it would be also helpful to have in the background uh, funding uh, opportunities where smaller investments uh, can be uh, uh, supported. But as this is in many cases not the case, my point was that is important to strengthen the companies uh, when it comes to uh, profitability and productivity uh, first, because uh, they have to generate uh, the money they have to spend uh, for investments. And uh, there it is helpful to have uh, uh, advisors that uh, support uh, companies, uh, especially uh, SME, uh, in uh, a process of uh, continuous improvement uh, where they really identify how to improve their businesses uh, in a sustainable way. And of course, uh, the world economy uh, after uh, or under COVID-19 uh, also will uh, cause questioning of current business models. And so, of course, this is an uh, opportunity, but of course, it's a, a challenge uh, for these smaller companies that are in a weaker position than larger brands uh, that uh, can better define the rules of the game. And so, uh, I think what uh, we are talking in Europe about is the green recovery. How can we, as European uh, Union, uh, combine the COVID-19 recovery with something going in line with a green deal uh, for sustainable production and consumption. And I think if uh, this helps to build up uh, supply chains 
that are uh, future oriented and uh, also after COVID-19 more resilient. This also can uh, support that the suppliers at the end of the supply chain uh, benefit from such a process. But this also uh, means that uh, they need a support uh, and a certain orientation, also security, that if they opt for this uh, uh, path that might be different from the business usual, that they really can rely of their customers, uh, that uh, they will be part of the game also in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. And maybe, Vikas, maybe you can uh, add some viewpoints to what Michael said on this topic. Yeah. So uh, even addressing the questions that were raised to me, I think that if you look at the small and the medium enterprises and the nano enterprises in India, or in South Asia especially, uh, the barrier and the incentives are similar. You need a market incentive, you need a policy incentive, and you also need an incentive from the government and the procurers that are both financial in nature as well, so that green production happens. And producing more with less has to become the buzzword and the keyword, and that's where the business case is. You look at any manufacturer, even an, an agricultural farmer, if he can produce more from the same field with less intensive pesticides, fertilizers, water, energy, electricity, he would definitely be interested in those processes to do so. But does he have the market intense in incentive when he's trying to sell that? What is the minimum support price? What does the government policy say in that regard? So all these stakeholders have to play their role for the smallest manufacturer to feel that producing green makes sense, makes business sense. Thank you very much. Uh, and Louis, maybe you can chip in also some of the uh, ideas you are having. Yes, I, I think uh, <clears throat> there is very important to maintain in, in the, this perspective, try to, to make a, a, a continuous analysis about how to supply chains are changing or changing right now. And it's, from the head producer, the, like uh, usually is, is uh, our big companies, but uh, and uh, and then in the chain supply chains, there is a small and medium companies. There, in, I think this is very important. Try to make a, uh, a relationship with the big producers or the or the head producer with the policy makers in this situation, because uh, like uh, Bika said. The, the incentives is very important right now. Try to the governments try to define some kind of incentives to, in focus in the supply chains, and and try to to facilitate uh, technical information. Try to 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 give in technical and practical information to the small and medium companies to introduce the resource efficiency in the and their plants. Or, or they are in maybe the small investment that and they can do right now, try to maintain the operations uh, the better way, possible better way in this emergency. So the, I think that there is a lot of information in like uh, you need to make a, in all the programs about the resource efficiency, but sometimes and there is not a relationship between governments or policy makers and the supply chain health producers. So that maybe that is very important to, to, to make some plans to introduce this kind of information in the uh, national plans to um, reactive the economy in our countries, made especially in development countries. Try to, to define some kind of incentives uh, to the small and medium companies to introduce the green production and in, in this emergency. So the, there is a, a maybe this is a, a, a way uh, to 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 give this kind of information to uh, the big quantity of the companies in our countries to introduce the resource efficiency and the supply chains.
Thank you very much, Luis. Um, I was listening to um, what uh, Michael, Vikas and Luis were saying, and I'm also keeping an eye on our chat that uh, I, I see that a number of the listeners and participants here are using it actively to point to questions. And uh, both actually give me the feeling that uh, there's a strong understanding that on outside SMEs and outside SME type participants in the supply chain, there's a lot to be done by the other two main actors, which are their customers, end of supply chain and which are governments, um, in order to enable and facilitate uh, that goes uh, enable and facilitate uptake of uh, RECP measures and of course they incentivize let's say. I think that is a part of what Michael in the beginning uh, mentioned and repeated actually now about the holistic viewpoint on um, resource efficiency measures and that they have to be seen in contact in context not only looking at the technicalities of it. Um, having said that I'm very happy that we can that we will discuss now uh, the point of the other stakeholders and we might look um, how industry and policy maker collaboration or can, can collaborate to ensure that the post COVID-19 resource efficiency measures are actually adapted to but also uh, to supply chain needs but also with that adapted by supply chain. So we are looking now a little bit more into the drivers which will get supply chains uh, to have more uptake um, and these drivers whether that's end of supply chain taking up things or whether that's regulatory framework or possibly increased access to finance we can discuss and I would maybe want to start with Mariana to give us an overarching view from the World Business Council's setting which is actually um, I believe ideal to introduce this part of our discussion here uh, because of your particular perspective going beyond single industries, going beyond single topics, focusing on a very important part of resource efficiency, which is the energy efficiency, which is in the thinking of uh, UNIDO at least, um, packaged with the resource efficiency, looking at resource energy as a resource. So maybe you can give us uh, your viewpoint on how industry and policy makers can collaborate to have these resource efficiency measures adapted to supply chain needs. Ayana, floor floor's yours. Super, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, so I, I know that you want to talk a little bit later about how exactly multinationals can support their supply chain. Um, so I'll stay a little bit away from that um, for the time being. Um, and talking about the policymaker angle here, I think you know what we're seeing today, um, and, and actually um, Michael has already alluded to that a little bit, is that policymakers have an opportunity to use the carrot and the stick, or both, within this crisis um, of how do you actually provide um, benefits um, and, and opportunities to companies to deal better with it and how do you at the same time set clear boundaries and regulations um, that will improve for the future. And I think both are actually needed now and both some governments are actually using both because if we're looking at the stimulus packages that are being designed, um, they're ultimately there to help build a low carbon economy and hence they allocate funds to those investments um, that would improve resource efficiency in the future, whatever type that is. And equally, um, we need to um, avoid um, impacts um, that would affect companies in a way that might actually be deteriorating in the future. Um, and so, for example, we might want to think about putting um, tougher criteria on resource efficiency right now, um, so that actually from a regulatory point of view, um, governments can make those adjustments um, and um, at the same time, hence, well, provide, the, provide the, the stick as well as the carrot with the same hands effectively. And I think we, we have a unique opportunity um, that those two can go right in, hand in hand right now. I think similarly, we need to be very careful about um, which measures we're using those for. 
because I think I heard in some news and press articles calls for supporting um, renewable electricity generation, for example. Well, actually, if we look at data and statistics, we find that renewable is the cheapest form of electricity generation in almost two thirds of the world. Um, so the question is, do we need that? Um, well, you know, maybe in certain circumstances, but generally, probably not. Um, and hence, really making sure that that support that government is providing is well adjusted to local circumstances and also is addressing the real barriers of acceleration that we see um, are two of the effects that I think, you know, we haven't really talked about much um, to date. And I think ultimately what would be sort of the, like the gold standard of, um, of uh, ideal policy making going into the future, which of course is equally hard to achieve, um, and, and um, would be to have regulation that actually asks for life cycle assessment of a product in any type. Um, and as much as that information should be given from any supplier to their customers, of course, customers also need to have clear decision criteria that use that type of information to make the best, uh, choose the best product for their for their company. And hence then we're actually moving away from price being the predominant decision criteria, but also taking into account other parts of, um, uh, of decision criteria that could either be environmental or actually even be social. Um, and a lot, a lot need to happen before we can be at that gold standard um, and policy and industry need to collaborate better. And I think, you know, we're seeing some of these initiatives starting in some places of the world where we see first um, pilot programs um, or actually just companies themselves starting to use these criteria more and more. And I think those are the first steps in, in, in that in the right direction, ultimately. Maybe, um, I don't know if you, if you want to reply now, but maybe we can do that later. I think uh, both you, Mariana, as well as Claire, I, I would like to um, understand whether it is, when you say taking multiple issues into account, environmental might also be social, might be uh, in other forms responsible. Of course, if uh, my, for example, my understanding is that uh, GlaxoSmithKline um, Claire sitting here has around 30,000 suppliers. I've talked to other multinationals who have 60, 70, 80,000 suppliers. Um, it's not so easy to understand. It's it's not so easy to understand what they really are doing, right? So um, uh, it, it would be nice um, if you want to go into this direction, incentivizing. One of the questions is. I don't like the word control, but there's a certain, let's call it reliable reporting of what's being done. Um, how do you come to these things? Is it realistically realistic or how realistic is that if you have lots of SMEs in your target group, um, will they be able to actually do that? Uh, because reporting means cost, right? Reliable reporting means more cost. So is that uh, something which is actually a way forward and maybe it's something I can also throw to all of you, Michael, Louis, Vikas as well, from your respective perspective, there's something to maybe wave into, weave into your replies uh, to the main question of collaboration. Yes, Mariana, do you want to respond now or do we leave that to later? I'll say a couple of words because I, um, I think it, it nicely fits in now. So, of course, uh, you know, it, this doesn't come easy and, and we're not totally talking about exactly understanding what your supply chain is doing. Um, but and, and like, you know, tier one, it, it might be already a really hard job for some companies, like, for example, the one that Claire works for. Um, but um, but equally, if we're starting to talk about uh, several tiers beyond that, you know, it almost gets into an, an, an impossible exercise. So, of course, we also need new reporting frameworks. Some of those which exist already, some of them like might need to be adapted more to SME use because, you know, like when we're looking at those that are used by multinational companies who usually have bigger resources available, you know, there is a number of reporting frameworks that work well and they can be improved. But for SMEs, actually, that's not my area of expertise. So I'll let that to Michael and others to comment upon what is available there and what isn't. But of course, it needs to be something that works. 
And I think, you know, we're seeing that today actually with scope three emissions, um, you know, when we're just looking now, for example, as an environmental factor, where um, a lot of companies really struggle with actually reporting their scope three emissions accurately. Um, and that is a problem for some of them, depending on the materiality of those emissions. And I think, you know, equal concepts will have to be applied for other types of resource efficiency um, as, as this develop, starts, field starts to develop. Um, and yeah, again, I'm not saying this is easy, um, but I think it's also a question of where do you start? How do you phrase your journey? Um, and where do you want to be at the end? Um, and some some companies and some areas of the world will be able to do it faster than others. Um, but that shouldn't deviate us from the goal of, of wanting to have a sustainable supply chain. Thank you so much, Mariana. Um, before uh, giving over to Michael, let me inform you, I don't know if uh, uh, all the panelists have the opportunity to follow at the same time the chat, but I can see already there are a lot of chat messages which start also depending, uh, uh, debating among the chat participants about the best ways forward. And there is a discussion of um, external positive incentives which are being sought um, and are for some the only way forward that SMEs would have to actually um, uh, use resource efficiency as a means to increase, increase resilience and work out of the COVID-19 difficulties. Michael, um, with this additional point maybe, <laughs> just to make your work a little bit more easy in, uh, in providing us some insights on uh, the possible collaboration between industry and policymakers mm -hmm. that we are addressing yeah. in this room. Thank you. Uh, yeah, where shall I start? Uh, I think uh, I have to respond in two directions. That means one on the more pragmatic uh, level. That means uh, today I'm representing uh, a global GRZ project supporting resource efficiency uh, dialogue and strategies in emerging economies uh, of the G20. Uh, that is commissioned uh, by the Federal Ministry of Environment. And I think there what we really try is to support multi-stakeholder dialogue uh, at a high level where we bring uh, policymakers together uh, with uh, representatives uh, from the private sector, uh, from the business associations to sort out how at the national level uh, a strategy uh, promoting resource efficiency uh, can look like and uh, of course when we talk about uh, international supply chains that goes much beyond uh, the scope of uh, uh, government and the jurisdiction of a country and uh, therefore uh, the influence uh, that uh, governments might have uh, uh, is uh, limited and when we talk about international supply chains, I'm not so much uh, worried about uh, progressive international brands really taking the lead, but there are a lot of free riders. Uh, and uh, that means uh, that are going, or that means that are trying to bypass uh, environmental and social uh, standards uh, to, uh, yeah, in a way that also uh, contributes uh, to a certain uh, price dumping. And so, I think it's really important uh, that uh, we come to, uh, as it was already said before, to a more coordinated approach where on the one hand uh, the international brands uh, are of course uh, are important players as they uh, are able or should be able to uh, transmit the message uh, into their uh, suppliers uh, value chain but of course, this requires that at the end of uh, the supply chain, the consumers also have to recognize this additional effort that uh, reflects in prices, that in, uh, reflects uh, in uh, uh, certain labels, whatever. That means if the end customers do not recognize this effort, you can make a lot of uh, efforts along the value chain that uh, are not uh, uh, being productive and uh, there the incentives uh, might be uh, useless. And so 
uh, we have to connect the two ends uh, the consumers and the suppliers uh, and have uh, more transparency uh, along the value chain and I think that's also a reason why uh, the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and also the Ministry of Labour are uh, thinking about uh, corporate obligations on supply chains. That means at the moment uh, we have uh, the National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights Monitoring uh, where we have voluntary commitments and uh, I think uh, this is a process now or a phase where uh, government in Germany uh, uh, analyzes how far these uh, voluntary commitments uh, uh, are successful but they consider of course as uh, option B corporate obligations by law uh, preferably at the European level, uh, uh, governing due uh, diligence. Uh, and uh, this means uh, if the carrot mechanism uh, uh, does not uh, work, then it might be necessary to have a more proactive legal framework conditions that uh, support these companies which are front runners but avoids the free riders uh, to shy away. Um, Michael, can I um, come back to what you just said and ask you to maybe help me disentangle one particular point? Um, so essentially what we, kind of a premise of resource efficiency is a certain, um, benefit that the companies have in implementing resource efficiency um, processes because it will benefit their economic bottom line. They will be able to produce um, their products cheaper because of the resource cost being decreased. And what we see actually in many developing countries, less so in industrialized countries, they are higher on the optimization, like they're higher, more optimized typically, but in developing countries frequently, uh, we see that actually moderately easy measures uh, are giving them substantial and very fast um, return on investment. Now, if that is a premise on resource efficiency, um, wouldn't that mean that it is actually, it should be actually moderately easy to convince companies to have more resource and also including SMEs, always assuming finance is around, let's say, to have these measures and wouldn't it then be less of enforcement also along the supply chain to actually ensure that this is being done. Of course social framework completely different field because very frequently a higher social responsibility goes along with higher costs but conceptually on the resource efficiency side it should go along with lower costs uh, even after having to account for uh, returning loans, let's say, to make an investment or so in the long run, cost should decrease. So how does that tally with the underlying thought that you have of stronger enforcement and more push necessary to, to move things forward? Hmm. That means uh, this idea that uh, resource efficiency due to savings uh, is uh, a process uh, that uh, is uh, convincing and uh, is really uh, uh, explaining uh, by itself. I think this is uh, an assumption uh, that might be true for some companies where the low hanging fruits are easy to harvest. But experience has shown that after really uh, capturing the low hanging fruits, uh, the efforts uh, to be made, uh, the, or the efforts that have to be made are more critical uh, and cost savings have their limits. And so uh, just to uh, focus on saving costs is not a sufficient argument because this process also takes time. And in uh, cases where uh, SMEs are really fragile in financial terms and where return on investment uh, that goes beyond one year is nearly uh, not affordable to them. Uh, uh, we have to recognize 
that even recognizing that there might be a potential for savings for them, they prefer the business as usual, they know, as this is the secure way to go. And so uh, that means this is even more important uh, in international supply chains. That means when we look, for example, into the textile industry, uh, there are companies reporting that from year to year, the price they get for the products is lower. And so how will these companies be encouraged to make an investments in environmental protection and social security, whatever? Uh, and therefore I say, uh, if we want these suppliers to be more responsible when it comes to environmental standards, when it comes to social standards, they must be sure that their international customers stay with them also the next year uh, and uh, go into longer business relationships that are reliable. Thank you. Um... If I may jump to Claire, because I, I think what we what we um, need to hear a little bit more is um, after hearing um, opportunities of what needs to be changed or provided uh, by governments and industry, maybe you can shed some light from your perspective what you can or what a large company like GlaxoSmithKline actually can do and what they can't do and consequently on the what they can't do how governments could help bridging a possible gap in incentives after hearing what's all needed maybe you can give us a little bit of uh, of idea what's on the supply side uh, in terms of um, how to move things forward and what's actually from your perspective doable <laughs> Well, that's a giant question, and clearly I'm only one one company. Um, and I obviously come at this from an environmental sustainability angle, so I'll just preference that up front. I'm not going to touch the social aspect. So just from the environmental piece and from a from my company's sort of perspective, I think the challenge is still coming back to it is the carrot and the stick perspective. Um, we have thousands of suppliers and in most cases we are also only a small proportion of that supplier's offtake. So even if we did everything with our entire supply network that wouldn't really scratch the surface on you know the, the ultimate goal of, of international supply chains. So this is where I come back to my first point which is it has to be a collaborative approach but it has to be a targeted piece and part of that targeting is what are we looking at? So what are we going to be addressing? Um, is it looking at, you know, because when we look at, when we've done the, the assessments on our value chain carbon, for example, we look at it from a life cycle approach. So when we're looking at, can we design green chemistry into the very, very start of the discovery and processes of the drugs, all the way through to um, processing and manufacture, and then also into sort of potentially disposal aspects as well. So we're looking at where is the carbon specifically, uh, that's the piece we've mapped out, where is that sitting in that value chain? And therefore, where are the hotspots to action? Then when you look at that, it's providing that collaboration on, well, it's we can't move the needle on some of this stuff on our own. So who do we need to work with to really target some of those aspects? Um, and then once we know who we need to work with and are the policies in place to support in that country specifically, but also the education and training, because we we have done as a company, we have gone in and um, done sort of energy audits with our supply chain. We've done water efficiency projects with our supply chain. We then leave <laughs> and the company is left either with a high tech asset that they can't maintain or the education hasn't been kept up and supported. So look, I'm not saying I have the solution. I'm saying what some of the things we've tried that haven't fully changed and, and really been embedded. So what I suppose more, Stefan, to, to maybe not answer your question, because I'm not saying what do I think the barriers and what, what I think can't we do. I'm actually here to say, we know this is a problem. How can we work through the solutions? What are the right collaborations, the right targeted action? 
how can we work with the policymakers in the local countries? How can we work with the other partners in that supply chain? Because it isn't just going to be us. And how do we get that progressive education training support coming through? So this isn't just, and I'm talking very much from my perspective here, this isn't just one company going in, changing something, leaving. That, that for me is not a system change. Thank Possibly you. more of my opinion than GSK's, just to be conscious, but... <laughs> yeah, we are all here in our personal capacity, right? <laughs> uh, I should have said that up front. We are all here in our personal capacity, so no company statements here. Um, now, uh, two questions. A, um, uh, there was a question uh, which was addressed to you specifically, actually, and that was... Um, you had uh, mentioned before agile supply chains and uh, one of our um, participants wanted to know if you could define that a little bit closer and then i have another follow-up for you actually okay hold on yeah so agile supply chains what i'm talking about there is being able to very quickly turn on working with new partners or new suppliers as a healthcare company, one of the challenges we do face, so maybe Stefan to answer your question, we are bound by quite tight regulatory controls um, and obviously quality and safety, absolute paramount um, criteria for us. So being able to work with new partners and new supply chain has been a challenge. During COVID, we've been able to, to move that a little bit faster and a little bit further. And I think going forwards in a post COVID world, that's what I meant by agile. It's the ability to work with new partners and partnerships um, in a way that hasn't been done in the past. So, I mean, one example that we've got, um, which is out in the press, if anybody wants to see it, is how we've worked with Sanofi, how we're working with AstraZeneca, um, other, other pharmaceutical companies to work through testing, um, development of adjuvants. So just one example, but that's what I meant by agile is how can we qu quickly move and flex and develop to changing situations and become hopefully more resilient in the part in the future and there is a, there's one more question i would like to from the audience that i'd like to confront you with uh, in a way <laughs> <laughs> so it's not an easy okay. one um, you were you were uh, in your answers and for me fully understandably you were focusing on the necessary framework conditions in the different countries that your pre-products or your services that you procure uh, are coming from in order to get somewhere. And I actually, I should say, I take that also as a task for UNIDO to um, be more available to jointly create such framework conditions. But uh, one of our listeners was actually uh, asking how importing countries and the examples mentioned by that listener is EU 28, USA, that means uh, countries where you are sitting effectively um how can they address sustainability concerns in exporting countries meaning uh your example was working with the source country the question is here the recipient country can they do something um any response to that offhand if not then we maybe ask later on mariana maybe maybe do that anyway but uh <laughs> Uh, in terms of, just to be clear, you're talking about the recipient country being able to influence what happens in the, the, source. In the source country. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that the answer that I would say off the top of my head is the recipient countries are normally where the products are sold or provided. Um, and that is where you do get the balance of incentives. To I think to Michael's point, it's the incentives that the, the customer uh, wants that criteria, but also the governments in those countries or the or the policymakers or the purchasers uh, in that country will actually support that, that um, potentially a price difference, but also what is the wider price concept of the product. So I think it's a difficult one to answer from, from just from my aspect, um, <laughs> but I don't know if Mariana, you want to add anything? <laughs> I, I can't speak for governments in, the, in those countries. <laughs> I would, I would like to come, maybe take a tour now to go to Vikas as... Yeah. But maybe as uh, to yes. uh, responding to this point, uh, as uh, the European uh, Commission 
is now uh, standing up for a green deal and uh, a green recovery. I think this has the potential of becoming a game changer. And this, of course, uh, would have a strong impact on those countries being considered countries of origin of products or uh, uh, basic materials, raw materials. Uh, that means uh, aligning uh, with the philosophy uh, and the principles of the green recovery, of course, can help uh, producing countries to uh, shift from a business as usual uh, economy to a more a circular, to a more climate friendly uh, and also a socially responsible uh, economy. And I think this is something, of course, it's an ambitious program and uh, of course it's uh, not a fact yet, but I think it has a potential to become a game changer. Thank you, Michael. Um, point taken, I should before leading over to Vikas, I, I feel compelled to throw in one remark from my own perspective, although as a moderator, maybe I should stay out of this debate per se. But um, one of the issues in what we termed here so nicely recipient countries, but which is in the end industrialized countries, um, having in particular governmental action is that there is always a very difficult and very fine line to tread from becoming non-tariff trade barriers, which in essence is undermining what a large part of what is driving um, driving the processes which pushes people out of poverty, which is international trade. So we have to be very careful, governments will have to be very careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater in erecting non-tariff trade barriers with best intents, you know, to facilitate something, but which in the end leads to um, shielded markets. Uh, not that this is uh, a trade-off per se, but it's very difficult with a relatively blunt instrument that governments have to properly adjust. In my personal opinion, and I try not to comment myself again, instead I give it over to Vikas and maybe you can um, give us a little bit more perspective because you have both minds. You have the SME mind, you have the uh, multinational mind. Yeah, so I would respond to this question in two parts. One is that um, from a recipient country perspective, India is the largest consumer of palm oil. But the palm oil, the way the Europe looks at it, palm oil and palm oil consumption is very different from where the Indian government looks at palm oil consumption in India. I, at the moment, am doing a piece of work for International Sustainable Trade Initiative. And what we're doing there is to get the market players, to get the government players to look at sustainable procurement policies, especially the government, because government procures palm oil in a big way for its uh, large programs to feed the poorest of the poor, the uh, child care programs we have, the way we blend it with other um, uh, edible oils. So for how do you kind of create a sustainable procurement policy from the for the government so that this becomes an issue? Now, added to that, to so something that Claire also mentioned about is about the um, life cycle analysis and how do we look at which is an issue that becomes most important for you? Now, when you do a materiality survey or an index, and I've tried to understand what are the material issues for a company from a multinational perspective, you plot those out for yourself, but you have to triangulate it against the other stakeholders to say that what may be very relevant for you may not be so relevant for the community that you're living with or where you're manufacturing. So your materiality has to be in sync with your stakeholders if you have to run a sustainably viable, economically viable production uh, facility anywhere in the world. So that's where the overlaps will have to start to happen. And to quote the SDGs, collaboration is the name of the game. It's one of the enshrined SDGs is on collaboration and networks and partnerships. And for a reason that they're there.
Yes. So thank you very much, Richard. And thank you for advising me. And I didn't get the clue that I didn't have my microphone turned on. But now uh, it's all good. I would like to come to Lewis, actually. And I would like, in addition to the question which is generally posted, the collaboration, I would like to throw in a question that also comes from the chat. And that is um, how OEMs, how end of supply chain manufacturers, can support their supply chain for implementing clean technologies and how they can incentivize the supply chains to work on green initiatives. Maybe you can shed a little bit light on the combination of the original question and this, because I'm sure that in your work, you're considering a lot on how to incentivize uh, suppliers to actually, or companies to actually get greener. Yes, uh, thank you. I saw some question in the chat about this. Uh, the incentives is not particularly to to be from the government. You know that it's possible that the uh, private sector uh, defines some in incentives in the supply chains. And here in Guatemala, uh, for example, we launched two years ago a web tool to help to the small and medium companies mainly to make a self-assessment about the, your, their, their environmental performance. And we are working with some uh, large companies, try to define some criteria to uh, motivate to the uh, uh, suppliers to um, increase the, or to have a, a best for environmental performance practice in trying to introduce some practice. So I think that it's very uh, important to the, the large companies maybe can define uh, a list of some strategic um, practice to convince or to motivate some uh, suppliers to, to introduce in the operations. For example, um, because uh, Michael um, talked about um, the, some problem or some cha challenge is the financial situation of the and the capacity to invest for of the small companies in in the green um, practice. And so the we we talk with the large companies try to define some practices that don't necessarily have to make an investment to introduce in the supply chains. And a small uh, uh, practical in, in example is the water balance. And like a three weeks ago, we have a webinar about the uh, water consumption. And we have a, 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 a survey in the, in the webinar. And the 70% of the companies are uh, were in the webinar didn't and don't do a, a water balance in the two in the last two years. So a lot of the companies right now even know <laughs> how they are using the water, for, just like a example. And that's kind of the ideas that the, the large companies try to introduce this concept in the supply chains, like a, you know. It's very useful and uh, that you can do a uh, energy balance, chemical balance, water balance in your operations, and because there is uh, a, a a good practice for us, like uh, the large company or like uh, the client, and this kind of information is a, a good and, and practical way to define how can uh, optimize the consumption of the, the resource efficiency and the provision of the, ES, uh, the small and medium companies. So th don't try to maybe to uh, require some specific and technical or some specific and technologies and operations because uh, the first idea in the small and medium companies, I don't have money for that. So. The, the idea in, in, in this program and with, in Guatemala is try to list a uh, wish list of the low in best practice to motivate in the first, like a first phase in the small and medium so, in suppliers 
try to, to, to introduce this green concept in the operations. And this is helping uh, to convince, to motivate to the small and companies to, to, to give uh, the first step. And maybe, and it's, it's very hard to understand because in Guatemala, for example, we already have 20 years working in the resource efficiency, in the efficiency and cleaner production, but there is a still point in the small and medium companies that they don't um, introduce a uh, basic practice like a water balance and environmental controls and K performance indicators and, and so on. So that's, I think that is a, maybe it's a great opportunity to try to introduce this a small list of the uh, uh, first phase practical environmental practice in the small companies and from the large companies to the small and medium companies. Thank you very much, Louis. And I can see we have already collected um, a number of suggestions for the industry side uh, in terms of incentives, um, top-down, bottom-up incentives. We have talked a little bit about the associated difficulties, but I would like to go back to Mariana um, and talk about maybe you have looking at the time that we have left you have uh, the possibility to actually give some um, semi-final words on also how you see the government role and I should say um, we have here several questions one of them is uh, for example how would you see the roles of national and subnational governments what can they do to incentivize um, smaller companies, supply chain participants, beyond what the supply chain leaders can do, or maybe they can't incentivize. What is the framework? What is the framework that maybe supply chain, uh, so the suppliers in the supply chain, or their end customers could actually uh, have facilitate their work? And um, how can governments help? Can governments help, or could they should they stay out of this? Uh, thank you, Stefan. So I, I think, you know, I'm probably not the best person to answer on, on what government should be doing. Um, I think the point that I was raising earlier about, well, basically, like, I think, you know, the, the answer to that uh, from, from the perspective of, uh, of our work with multinational companies, I've already made. So um, if you want to really hear about the government perspective, then you may be one of the other panelists can take that question. Um, but I'm very happy talk about the multi, what, what multinational support company, what multinationals can give to support their SMEs. Um, up to you. Can I take the question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I've been working on a pro bono basis as a part of a team with the government of India for the last 10 years. And we are the team responsible for creating a framework of responsible business practices for environment, social and economic issues. It has been a long and a lengthy process. And I think government definitely has a role because government, government is something that provides a governance framework. And if you don't have a governance framework, then each of the sectors can talk at cross purposes with each other, with none the wiser. So the government cannot abdicate its role from governance and hence a framework and a policy framework on these issues from government is very important. You may have industry people like me and other people who are there on the panel to advise on how to create this framework, how to sell this framework to companies big and small, but government definitely has, has a role. Vikas, what would you see as the main elements of such a framework? Um, Meaning what, what larger topics would have to be addressed? Larger to to topics to be addressed would definitely be resource efficiency. Human resource deployment and training. And on, on added to that would be supply chains. These would be the three top things that I would say are most important. If you get these right, you're almost 80% there. And you would ask the government to police or to provide a legal framework for the companies to act within. What is your 
preference. So on a little flip side, we have had licensed Raj for a long time, first with the British and then with our present, with the previous governments as well. So I'm not very happy with the policing idea. The idea has to be educating and seeing the business case and the value of doing it. That means um, you think the role of the government is in a way advocacy, maybe with a little bit incentives and frameworks sprinkled in, but advocacy of the principles in order to have small scale industries, SMEs understand their benefits that they will face and make them receptive for the demands of larger companies. One small piece of work that we are doing is that the, the children who go to government schools have a prescribed dress form. We are trying to see how do we re reduce or completely create a supply chain which does not have child labor involved in producing school dresses for children. So we get all the stakeholders involved, including the children who are going to finally wear those school dresses. How do we ensure that? So policing is not going to be the answer. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I'm speaking only for, par for part of the countries. Uh, we are doing development, so our focus is developing countries. Uh, but I would say for many of those, that's not the whole world, but for many of those, I'm sure that policing is not necessarily what functions best, because in many of the countries we work in, um, enforcement of uh, more uh, of beyond the most basic laws has often certain gaps, uh, which makes it difficult to actually get it fully done. But maybe Mariana, on the basis of the comments that Vikas mentioned, um, if you look at the company role, the needs and the potential needs from the government, anything you can point out from that perspective? Mm. Tough call. Yeah, so I, yeah, I think it's a tough call. I mean, I think, you know, we, I think with companies of any type, of any size, actually, either being a multinational or being small and medium enterprises, really need to look at is, um, what is the best practice today um, in in sourcing um, materials, energy, water, or, or how to use waste? Um, and that means they need to look and define the energy or, or resource in general um, related financial and environmental objectives, and then set out a clear roadmap of how do you achieve them. And that also includes defining your role as a company within your value chain, seeing what opportunities do you have to influence your customers and your uh, suppliers. And effectively, I like really what Claire said earlier, because it's exactly the same language that we use. How do you really build a long-term relationship with your supply chain? Because that's what this is about today. It's not about getting the cheapest deal and the best cost or you know the best uh, cheap, fastest delivery. It's about developing long-term relationships um, that, that stand and hence, from there onwards, you find to see opportunities of how you can together achieve resource efficiency. And we, we've put together a guide actually that is available on our webpage um, where um, anyone can read our best practice on how to formulate those strategies and particularly how to work best together um, with your suppliers and your customers. Um, and so they, they look, for example, at um, synergies around waste streams or joint investment opportunities and heating networks, cooling networks, storage opportunities. Um, they look at third party financing, um, helping your suppliers achieve better credit um, ratings um, because of your backing or providing even if you have the ability um, financing directly to uh, your suppliers. So there's lots of opportunities of how this how this can be achieved. And I'm happy to put a link into the chat function um, so that anybody can access that. Thank you very much, Mariana. And actually, um, we are reaching the end of the time that has been allocated for this webinar. Um, before thanking all of the panelists and all of the participants for being in here, I would like to say that we seem to have reached agreement on uh, the benefits that long-term relations, and that means dependable long-term relations between responsible um, 
OEMs or end of supply chain companies, responsible multinationals and their supply chains would have. Responsible multinationals would be multinationals who try to facilitate through their supply chain um, our resource efficiency, but also social norms possibly, and who would actually then be able to look at framework in the countries where they receive it, which is principally supportive in a number of ways. Um, we have also, I believe, implicitly recognize that resource efficiency will help the resilience of SMEs, although it will not help them getting by itself completely out of any COVID-19 slump they will experience or they are experiencing. And uh, I think what for sure we have learned is that resource efficiency is a meaningful way forward to help um, supporting the environment and protecting the environment, including but not limited to issues of climate change. And that advancing is, it whether it costs some money or it gives higher profits, but overall, it's an extraordinarily cost-effective solution to work on environmental issues. And is therefore something that I think all of our panelists and hopefully many of our participants will pursue in the future. And with that, I would give a heartfelt thank you again to the panelists, to our team at GGKP, which did a tremendous job of preparing this webinar and giving us the technical backbone to make it happen. And um, to all of you participants for taking the time of listening in. Thank you very much. And uh, it was a pleasure sitting here. Thank you. Thank you, panel. It was a pleasure working with you. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you, Thank Stefan, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.